Okay. Um, let me close one screen. Then I can have just one screen to share. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, so now I'm sharing the entire screen, but I want to start from here. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Yes. So transformational leadership. Uh, that's our title for today. Transformational leadership. Um, and I was as I was explaining, this is the the culmination of what we've been discussing all through in this unit on biblical foundations uh, of uh, leadership, uh, because it really responds to, or it leads to responding to the question that has been posed for your finals, if you remember, uh, the very final question that you have to deal with. Um, uh, because there's so much talk about leadership values on this continent. Um, and, and all that is emanating or generated from um, organizations, some that are religious organizations. So we are not lacking in any way resource base for values. Um, if it's education, we have really relatively fairly educated countries in Africa. Um, we, you saw the statistics from the question that I posed that uh, now missiologists are talking about um, the world's largest population of Christians being found in Africa. Can you imagine? On the face of the earth, the largest Christian population is found in Africa. Okay? And we have seen a growth, politically growth of um, economies in, in Africa. We've seen um, countries growing into becoming democracies or rather trying to envision democracies um, on the continent. And yet the contradiction is that we still remain to be um, a continent that bears some of the world's poorest countries. We still remain to be a continent that, that has some of the largest populations of world's poorest people with very underdeveloped or undeveloped structures infrastructure, I mean, um, and, and also that means broken um, uh, social structures too. Um, and, and broken society means broken people. Um, really struggling. People talking about um, food security, for example, in the 21st century. Can you imagine? 21st century, people talking about food security. People struggling to put even two meals on the table in this day and age. And I mean, I'm not talking about in the village. I'm not talking about um, asal areas. I'm talking about even in the city, such as Nairobi. You wonder. What kind of leadership are we talking about? What kind of leadership have we been talking about has been preached all along? Okay. So what is transformational leadership and, and what contribution does it make to make leadership be what God designed it to be, as we have seen it all along uh, in this trimester. So I think the first place to begin will be to try and define transformational leadership, what I'll be calling TL after now. 
And so transformational leadership is defined as a leadership approach that causes change, causes change in individuals and social systems, right? Transformational leadership is defined as leadership approach. So it's an approach that causes change. So a good leadership must show change, but transformational leadership shows change in two levels. One with individuals, so individual lives are improved, but also social systems are also improved. All right? In its ideal form, it creates valuable and positive change in the followers with the end goal of developing followers into leaders. So you see what, what transformational leadership is doing. It's not just a person leading people. <laughs> Excuse me. It's a leader leading followers with the intention of transforming the followers to becoming leaders who can reproduce other leaders. Hence the word transformational. Okay, very essential. And so the process of it, the process of transformational leadership is that it changes and transforms individuals. So if, if any individual ever claims to have interacted with a transformational leader and they are not changed as a person, as a people, then there's a problem. Okay, so a transformational leader ought to reproduce self. And the repo effect is felt, is felt as nations begin to see a change. But also it does incorporate charisma, charisma. The word charisma is also, um, it, it's actually borrowed from Greek for gift. So gifted and visionary leadership. There is another charismatic, I don't want us to confuse for that. When we say that such and such a leader is a charismatic leader, um, sometimes it comes across as someone who has the capacity to like speak, so a good orator. Like I used to hear people define former U.S. President uh, Barack Obama as a charismatic leader. And uh, during most of his presidency, I was, I was doing my studies in the U.S. and I could see that, that what majority of people meant was that he's a very good orator, and for sure he was. Very smart, very brilliant orator who could organize speech with very little assistance from, from uh, um, uh, are they called props? What are these things that they put in front of dignitaries to speak from? All right. So that's what they, they meant, that he's such a good charismatic leader. So give him a platform and he's, he's going to deliver a wonderful speech. But was he a gifted leader? All right. I have my reservations. Was he a gifted leader? I have my own reservations. Uh, but surely, you know, uh, without without any um, biasness, he was way better than um, others that we have seen after after him. But still, that word charismatic, a gifted leader, uh, almost seems to yes. Uh, thank you. The word is telepro teleprompter. Yeah. So um, that word borders vision, visionary leadership, visionary leadership. So a charismatic leader will all also be a visionary leader. So that's the process of a transformation leader. They change and transform people, incorporating their giftedness 
and their ability to be vision bearers. But also the influence of uh, a transformational leader involves an exceptional form of influence that moves followers to accomplish more than what is usually expected of them. So basically, uh, a, a transformational leader is, is supposed to come into an organization or a government or uh, whatever it is that they are leading. And by the time they are done with their assignment, the people that they have led have, have exceeded expectations in terms of performance, delivery, or becoming better people, or even becoming whole if it's a nation. Transformational leaders leave people on another level that was not even part of the argument in the beginning in absorbing them to be leaders. So what is the magic? What is the trick? What is it that they do that makes them stand out like that? Some of the core elements of transformational leaders is that the transformational leadership in itself is concerned with a number of things. And this is where I want you to catch um, the trick. What makes that difference is that transformational leadership concerns itself with emotions. So people's emotions are important to a transformational leader values, ethics, standards, and long-term goals. Very crucial, very critical. Emotions, values, ethics, standards, and long-term goals. Okay? And this involves or includes assessing followers' motives. Now, one has to be a really intentional leader to even be concerned about the followers' motives to satisfy their needs or the needs of followers. But also, just the sheer interest in treating them like people. So respecting their dignity. I mean, one has to be really intentional as a transformational leader to even entertain that thought. Because a lot of what you see, unfortunately, in leadership today is everything else apart from this. And you see that in, in political leadership, in institutional leadership, in governments, in organizational leadership, in whatever it is, you see everything else apart from what we have just said right now. Emotions, values, ethics, standards, long-term goals. Pretty much entirely missing with very little care about the followers. And so therefore, transformational leadership describes a wide range of leadership influence. And this could be specific, meaning one-on-one -on -one to a person individualized, or even broad, meaning influencing the entire organizational culture or a country's culture, a nation's culture, right? Because of what transformation leadership is. So followers and leaders are inextricably bound together in the transformation process. You know, um, I, I happened to visit um, uh, Canada one time when they were doing the elections. And um, what struck my, my um, mind was that people are getting uh, ballot papers shipped to their doorstep. And, and everyone who is registered to vote in that household was allowed to vote at home and then put back in an envelope 
that had been packaged inside the pack the parcel and post back to the collection point that was taken to the tiling center. Can you imagine? Just imagine that that sense of a culture, that culture of running elections in a country. That that you can give people the trust to vote from home and you're willing and waiting to receive all the ballots back into the tiling center by mail. You see, that's not a culture that has been put in place in the last five years. All right? But it has a beginning. It has a starting place. And the starting place has to be that there was a transformational leader somewhere in the process of the growth of that um, uh, democracy. They must have had just one person who said we must do things differently. But then it wasn't just overnight. That, I mean, had to be, you know, integrated with a lot of values, ethics, standards, quality within the people in that country. For people to get to that point of trusting the electoral system like that. I wonder which country we can do that in Africa. So, so that means everybody in that system is inextricably bound together in the transformation process. Everybody wants the good for everyone. And therefore, the country will succeed or the organization will do well. Company, whatever it is, will do well. Now, I want you to watch this clip briefly and then we proceed. But let me first of all make sure that you can actually see and hear. Today. Understanding and deriving meaningful insights from data is fast becoming the most needed skill in the business. Okay. Can you hear that in the first place? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So let me now blow it out and play. Just listen to this short clip. Transformational leadership is a very effective style of leadership. Decades of leadership research leads to a wide variety of positive outcomes. Followers of transformational leaders are motivated, engaged, satisfied, have positive attitudes, experience less stress and burnout, and perform at higher than expected levels. In order to be a transformational leader, one is required to perform behaviors that fall roughly into four broad categories. The first category, which is called idealized influence, includes behaviors that involve becoming a strong role model for your followers or your subordinates. You can become a strong role model by working very hard and by setting a positive example for everyone around you. If your followers see you working conscientiously and diligently day in and day out, odds are that they will begin to respect you and admire you. A second way by which you can become a strong role model is by being uncompromisingly ethical. Through your words, you can communicate to your followers that you have high moral and ethical standards. And through your actions, you can communicate that you stick to your high moral and ethical standards even when the going gets tough. A third way would be to emphasize to your followers the importance of having a common mission and make self-sacrifices to help your followers to realize that mission. Enacting such behaviors will earn their respect and they will want to identify with you and with what you stand for. The second category of behaviors is called inspirational motivation. It involves developing a promising vision for the future and then clearly communicating that vision to your followers through the use of inspiring stories, vivid imagery, and captivating symbols. 
It also includes making emotional appeals to your followers and urging them to work harder and go above and beyond their roles and responsibilities in the pursuit of this shared vision. Such appeals, especially if made by someone that they greatly respect and admire, often result in a high level of commitment and performance. The third category of behaviors is called intellectual stimulation. It includes encouraging followers to look at day-to-day -day problems from different perspectives and allowing them to come up with creative solutions to those problems. It also involves supporting your subordinates as they think outside the box and try new methods to solve existing problems. This might mean that you might have to have a certain amount of tolerance for mistakes that are made in the process because thinking outside the box and developing creative solutions can sometimes backfire. A good transformational leader does not let the fear of mistakes constrain the creativity of his or her subordinates and provides them with a supportive environment where they can take calculated risks. The fourth and final category of behaviors is called individualized consideration. This includes coaching and helping your followers to achieve goals. It also involves providing a supportive climate and carefully listening to their needs so that you can help them to fulfill those needs. The type of coaching that you can offer your followers may vary depending upon who is in need of help. For some followers, you might have to provide explicit guidance regarding how to get a job done, while for some others, you might have to offer them the resources that they need and let them figure out the solution on their own. These are the four types of behaviors which, if performed consistently, will make you a transformational leader that people respect and admire. And as noted previously, decades of research has shown that being a transformational leader pays huge dividends. If you like this video, please consider sharing it with someone else who might find it in that being a transformational leader pays. So class, just going back to that particular uh, screen that you can see, uh, what stands out for you on how to be a transformational leader? Which of these four areas or emphasis stands out for you in this sense that either you have seen or have never seen in any leadership environment? Yes, uh, Gaki and then uh, Juliana. Thank you, Doc. Uh, when I'm looking at, um, I stand to be corrected on this, but when I was going through them, I actually saw Professor Yiro picking all the four. And my question would be, can a leader at times exhibit all the four? Because I've seen a number of different things for the short time that I've interacted with him exhibiting those particular ones. Now to the question that you asked, I, I tend to feel individualized consideration for me works best um, because I get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, aspect, probably because of, of my personality. I'm not as outgoing. I, I prefer when it's a small circle and doing it together. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, you've seen that uh, personified um, in our vice chancellor. Um, and then this is your preference of leadership and, and no wonder you have resonated uh, with him so much in class in terms of enabling you to learn. I think uh, that's uh, remarkable uh, to hear. Um, and, and, but then uh, we have, uh, we had someone else before. Yes, yeah, so Juliana and then Caroline and let's go in that way. Oh. Okay. Oh. Hi. Thank you, Doc. What the one that stands out for me is the idea, idealized influence, because I, where I am, I'm really learning from the role model, the kind of leadership that we have here, is that they set an example of just working hard, and the the exemplar bit uh, is what works for me because I see what people do, working hard, and then it's easy for me to follow what they are doing instead of somebody telling you do this and then they are not doing it themselves. So the best is um, we learn from what the way they are working hard and then their ethical integrity, you know, 
when they tell you this is not right, you, you actually see they don't do whatever they are telling you. Then the second best is uh, when we learn from the stories of the company, that we started this company with this aim or this mission. So once you catch the vision of the company, then you, you easily run with it. Thank you. That's my submission. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And that uh, resonated very well with uh, what Gaki had said earlier um, in that um, you, you see what leaders are saying and they're actually doing it themselves. So they, they do the, they give the example and uh, look at how that crisscrosses with individualized consideration where you're providing explicit guidance, explicit. I mean, you're making guidance as explicit as possible. Um, then, then it marries with what you're just saying in, in modeling, in being the example, showing the example um, in very ethical ways. I, I like that. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, and then uh, Josephine, then Janie. Caroline Duke, are you there? Can you get closer to the microphone, please? Uh, yes, am I clear now? Am I clear? Yes, you are, proceed. Yes, uh, um, I'm learning a lot and I'm grateful for this type of leadership, TN. Uh, I've been asking myself what type of uh, traits do I want to have as a leader? Because from where I sit, I am a leader and I just want to understand what traits do I then need to possess for me to be able to adapt three and four. Because sometimes the environment may not allow you to do what you need to do for you to become a complete TL uh, leader. So one and two works well for me. But then three and four presents some challenges and I believe we're in this class together for us to, to learn. So would you mind maybe expounding on how we can achieve three and four, especially in a, in a working environment where the systems seem locked up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline, for that. I think um, you're, you're hitting a chord excuse me, that might resonate with many people here um, as, as on how do you uh, uh, live out three and four in an environment that may not allow you to do so, even when you know how to um, live it out. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me come back to that later uh, after we hear Josephine. Thank you, Doc. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the first, the previous speakers talked uh, tried to answer the first session, the first question you asked. So I'll concentrate on the second one, on the negatives. Uh, you asked uh, which ones have you not seen in uh, transformational leaders or leaders you have? So um, most of the leaders don't like working so hard. So most of the time they leave the, the subordinate to work so uh, to me it is uh, not part of this type of leadership then uh, the ethics the ethics is also one thing most of these leaders uh, mostly abuse their offices so uh, Maybe if we assess uh, the personalities of uh, the leaders, we may use this to get them out of this type of leadership. Then uh, some also do not tolerate mistakes. They want people to be very, very perfect. So I can say, that uh, most of these leaders do not uh, idealize the influence on people or the people they lead. Then uh, we also have this uh, intellectual stimulation. 
it is not so much on uh, some of our leaders. So I can say that we lack a lot of this in our type of leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, um, you're speaking the mind of um, this topic today because you've just talked about what is lacking in many places and lacking in the sense that you may get into an organization or when you're looking at um, um, a political economy and um, the values are stamped everywhere. I mean, you see them left, right and center, but then nobody actually leaves them. Like for instance, I, I haven't seen any country today that has no, an, you know, an, uh, what do you call this? This ethics body, this ethics and anti-corruption, I, I forget the, the entire title ethics and anti-corruption something most countries have that kind of a body but then you still see us ranking you know at, at the top of the most corrupt countries you wonder what has this got to do with leadership and then of course um you know you mentioned something that i wanted to respond back to caroline Dunge on intellectual stimulation whereby there is absolutely no room for or no room for tolerance of mistakes. And therefore people end up working every day so hard, fearing not to make mistakes, and eventually zero production. Zero production. Okay. Uh, that yes, it's called Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission. Yeah. Um, ESCC, <clears throat> right? So it, it's just a, um, um, a, an, a, a way of thinking that needs to be changed in our societies to change leadership or to try and transform leadership into this, all right? Um, because it is in the intellectual stimulation bit and individualized consideration that the rubber meets the road. And then you realize, oh, now you can see leaders in their true colors. You're able to see leaders who are going to get out of their way to coach and help their followers to be the best because they know that the outcome of them being the best means that they are going to become the best leaders themselves. Right, or just having a leader who can listen carefully to followers. You know, during uh, the last um, election campaign, um, I saw one of the candidates who was going around, you know, carrying notebooks and a pen and you know, listening to people from county to county, listening, um, or can we say pretending to listen? But then, you know. The, the the actuality of it is that they were not listening to anything. Because if they were taking any notes, any helpful and useful notes, um, you know, then that would be continued even now, even today. You'd be seeing such leaders listening to people and knowing where it pains the people and, and working with the people to improve um, situations in people's lives from various quarters and corners, okay? So it's one thing to say what TL is, is another thing to be a TL. Is uh, Caroline, are you trying to speak? See, you're unmuted. Anyway, there was one more hand up. I think that was Jenny. Yes, Dr. Terry, thank you. I I was just looking at uh, um, what it would take to actually be a transformational leader. And I, I tend to believe it is uh, those of us who are learning about transformational leadership, uh, those are the ones that would probably, excuse me, 
sorry about that. Those are the ones that would, uh, we're the ones who might bring the change that we actually want. Because I I work in an environment where I, I, I don't see people having the need for being role models. <laughs> there is no in intellectual stimulation. There is no consideration. Nobody wants to be the one to motivate. It's a it's a rather hostile environment, uh, whereby we we just say, oh, we we'll live we we'll live to fight another day. So learning about this is uh, actually talking to me and telling me maybe, uh, and I do sit in a leadership role. Uh, maybe I am that leader who is going to bring the difference, because if we look at uh, even other than just the, our working institutions, even the country we are operating in, uh, when a leader gets in, they they think about what's in it for them, what's in it for me, how many properties can I grab, how much money can I steal. So there's nobody really thinking about the impact you have on the organization you're leading or the people that you're leading. And probably... We who are learning about it are the leaders who's going to, who are going to bring a change that is so required mm -hmm. in the country. That is my thinking. Absolutely, absolutely. What is in there for me? Um, my wife and I were talking about um, um, a, a certain um, governor. Was it a governor? Or what do they call them in South Africa? Uh, people who had uh, provinces. Like the way you have Gauteng, you know, these other provinces, uh, the person who is in charge of that kind of a setup. Uh, so it, that would be an equivalent of governor in Kenya. Uh, one of them decided to make public education the best in the country. And, um, you know, believe you me, all his children go to the public school education system, public schools, because he made them to be what they should be, such that every other um, government officer, wealthy people are removing their kids from the private education sector to public, all right? Just the opposite of what uh, Jenny has described um, as um, how work environment is and, and what we are seeing around us where everyone is getting into leadership positions looking for what is in it for me what can I gain out of this and so when you when you find yourself Jenny in such a hostile environment that's that's a toxic environment that's a toxic work environment that may be so far from realizing transformational leadership. And so the question here is, I throw back to the challenge, what is your role um, in making that change? What is going to be your role in making that? You don't have to answer now, but just something to think about. Uh, because you're going to see an example shortly from the scripture. Yes, Juliet, and then we'll move on. Okay, thank you, Daktari, and good evening. So, uh, transformational leadership, a very interesting leadership style. And I think I, I got to hear about it when uh, we started this course this semester. Almost all the units we handled this semester, there was an area we are talking about transformational. There was an area we are talking about transformational leadership. And uh, maybe I can say, so far, our lecturers that we have interacted with from Daystar, I can say that I have seen that. That is my take. I have seen that in most of our lecturers, you being one of them, and not to pull your feet, but that is the truth. And uh, for instance, uh, there are several times uh, I think I've come to the class very down, eh? and sometimes you just make a point, maybe you are praying, you're just encouraging us, and I I just get the, the motivation to carry on, and I feel encouraged, 
like right now, even before you started the class, at least you could acknowledge that you guys, you are tired. I know, and you mentioned a number of things that we are handling, which is the truth. And so sometimes you feel you are very tired, you are very down, and there's a lot of work to be done. Like when we are telling us, take a break, take a break, and I'm like, does Dr. Tari really know the work that we have? They're waiting for us, uh, the, the thesis that we are starting, and the assignments, and so on, and a number of things. But I think when I look at part two, inspirational motivation, I don't know whether it falls there, but uh, just the emotional appeals to work harder there. Yes, despite everything, we are still being encouraged to work hard and just inspiring and encouraging us, even when things are not really being so good. And I think most of you have been a good example. Uh, as you, whatever you speak, uh, we see it in practice, like uh, uh, Gaki started by saying prof, and you just see the way he just comes out there and dedicated. I remember over the Easter, prof was, was with us from Friday. And even my husband was telling me, eh, hey, this is a professor of years, he's a unique man. He is a VC, I've never met such a, he's a leader leading from the front. At least he could acknowledge that because from Friday he's there and he's the VC and so on. Until, until even somebody who's not even a class member can note that. And I think it's, um, it's something that is there. People working and leading from the front end. I think it is just because of the background of the Christian foundation. And so there is the part of what the fear of God does, even in our leadership. So that is what I'm getting from there. So there's the part that the honoring God and just fearing God does, even as we go in our leadership. And as Jane has said, maybe we are the leaders that are being waited out there to come and bring this out. Because one day Prof told us that you might not understand why God led you to be doing this course. You might not see the uh, the reason now, but later you will get to know why God directed you here. And maybe God is preparing us for to take up and just bring that change that we need to see in this country and even outside the country if some of us will find ourselves there. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Juliet and uh, Faster. Thank you for the kind words. Um, I receive them, um, and also uh, thank you for the gracious words also to my colleagues and, and everyone else. Uh, I appreciate that on their behalf. And yes, um, if there's one thing that lacks in many spaces of, of uh, work environments, uh, leadership environments, is this. It's number two. Um, the the capacity to inspire motivation in leaders, the capacity to, in, 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 to inspire motivation. Because if there's one thing that people want um, is to be encouraged, is, is to know that um, they can work harder. They can work harder and they should because the, the space is given for them to do so with no threats, all right? Uh, no intimidation, no condescension. There's just a room, friendly environment to become. Um, and so this comes through inspiring stories, vivid imagery, captivating symbols that motivate people to work harder. You need to realize that by the time you, you get hired, if you are hired at a place, if you are serving at any capacity, uh, be it a leader or a follower, you qualify to be there. So what you need moving forward are uh, capacities beyond what you used to get into the job. You're basically needing to be enabled by being given the right environment, the correct environment, conducive environment to perform, to become the best, to serve, right? And so looking at these four, four approaches, ingredients of a TL, you realize one is missing or two is missing in spaces that you've been before or some are actually there in spaces that you've been before, 
um, and not all. Uh, sometimes you can come across all, but rarely will you find all. Um, and I want us to look at examples, and 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 I and I want to believe in looking at some examples. Uh, we're going to be answering Caroline's question um, on intellectual stimulation and individualized consideration. Let, let me just do that uh, right now. <clears throat> um, share my screen again. Yeah. Um, taking further. Uh, that discussion is um, the diagram before you, giving us the various components of a transformational leader or transformational leadership, uh, borrowed from uh, Dr. Jordan. It says a transformational leader has these areas, modeling the way, like you've seen, but also encourages that. In other words, inspires motivation. Everyone's heart needs to be encouraged, but also inspiring a shared vision. So there's, there's um, that um, knowledge, common knowledge in the organization or in the team or in the company or in a country where we are all free to bring out um, um, on the platform, an opportunity to share in the vision that the leader has shared with us to realize it. And therefore, by doing that, you're basically enabling everyone else to act. So no one is left out in the teamwork. So you see each other as a team, always as a team. Never will you see individualized or, or, or people working in silos. It's one of the biggest problems in organizations today that people tend to work in silos. And as you work in silos, you never get to appreciate what others are doing, yet you're in the same organization. You don't even know what people are doing and how that relates or connects with your, your mandate. Then also sometimes challenging the process. Challenging the process once in a while um, as, as a leader, you allow your followers to challenge the process and, and see how aspects like design thinking can be brought on board to change the way organizations operate to meet the needs of the people that you serve. Okay, very interesting. Uh, and, and I find these components from Dr. Jordan uh, really resonating very well with the video that we have just watched. And so transformational leadership then is a style where leaders work with teams. They work with teams to do a number of things. One is to identify needed change, All right? So is, is change needed? So people will say yes, but where is it needed? identify needed change. But then in doing that, you also create a vision to guide the change through inspiration and executing the change in tandem with committed members of a group. You see all that is falling in place here. Okay, so a change is needed, yes. But then you're going to inspire everyone to come alongside as a team, enable everyone who is on board to feel appreciated and needed so that together you can work to execute the change that is required as a member of the team. That is, I found, one thing I found in leadership is that there's nothing that inspires followers than to know that they are needed. That their contribution is valid. And actually they are needed, they are important uh, they are part and parcel of that organization. And without them, it's not the same again. So transformational leadership fosters that, fosters creativity, it encourages personal growth, builds strong leader-follower relationships, 
driving positive organizational change. Um, a lot of leader follower relationships are not so good today. In fact, uh, if some of you in this class were to speak about your own work environments, I will not be shocked to find that some of you can describe your leader follower relationships as sour. So some of you may be okay, may be good. Maybe you are the leaders actually. And so maybe you've learned from the best and you're becoming that transformational leader that is required by God. Okay. But once in a while, you'll come across uh, situations as we have had here in this class uh, today where uh, the leader follower relationships aren't there. And therefore, the work environments are so toxic, so hostile, that it kills your nerve, your motivation, no inspiration to invent, uh, to, to, to incorporate, um, uh, to create and make the environment, uh, the work, the work better to achieve the goals of, a, of an organization. Okay, and so much has been said about transformational leadership. What about the leader, him or herself? How about the transformational leader? Transformational leaders or leader is a passionate person. They are passionate about their work and the company's mission while also helping the people, the followers, the employees succeed. Now, that is a very strong composition if it's found in one man, in one person. A person who is extremely passionate about their work, their own work and the mission of the company, but also they are also passionate about helping employees succeed in their work, in their career growth. I mean, if you ever come across such a person, that's a gem. That's a transformational leader. And transformational leaders give priority to understanding what motivates individual employees or followers and helps them focus on the organization's long-term vision. I am encouraging you, I want you, this first class, that in the roles that you play as leaders, you aspire to be transformational leaders. That now you know what you have learned through this program. Desire to make it your leadership style. Because you're going to see shortly the person who has actually modeled for us transformational leadership. And this is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And my prayer in this last class, as we part ways in class this way, is that how I pray for each one of you to aspire to be a leader who will make that difference. Make that difference in that organization. For the glory of God, but also for the benefit of the people that you lead. One, to the glory of God, but also to the benefit of the people that you lead, such that they would, you know, their lives will be changed. Their lives will be transformed. And as their lives are being transformed, can you imagine, as their life are being, lives are being transformed in that organization, just imagine what happens to the organization. As we saw in the definition, the organization is also transformed. The organization has no life in itself. The life of the organization is the people. 
that is what a lot of leaders don't get. That an organization, a country, a division, a county, a location, an institution is animated by the people in and of itself has no life. The life of it is the people. Therefore, focus on the people and stand back and see how the organization will flourish. Let's look at Jesus' example here. And I'm going to invite um, volunteers to help me read as we wind up uh, from this passage. Now, I want you to see this as a cycle. Uh, right from Mark chapter 3, from verse 13, and this will also send us to where I started from. You remember, we started by me encouraging you to find some time and rest. Uh, so from Mark chapter 3, verse 13, and Mark chapter 6, 31 and 32, this is interesting. This is Mark 3, 13. This is Mark 6, 31. You're just swapping the, the, the numbers. You see a complete cycle. Complete cycle. So let's just have a look at it. Let's just have a look at it. Uh, can you see the Bible on my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay. So I'd like volunteers to read, and you can just read from my screen, from Mark chapter 3, from verse 13. Not, we're not going to read everything. We'll be skipping, as I will advise. Okay. So let's get uh, a volunteer to read 13 and 14. Well, let's, let's just pick it from here. Um, let's, okay, Brenda will read 13 and 14. Uh, then we'll skip to verses 31 and 34. Let me get another volunteer to read 31 to 35. That would be Maureen. Right? Then let me get another, um, the first one is Brenda. Another one, read uh, Mark 5. But uh, Mark 5, I'll tell you which verses when we get there. That would be Juliana. Then another one to read six. Uh, Cindy, Emma will read uh, six, and I'll show you which ones um, as Jesus is sending out the 12. So chapter six. And then lastly, the end of the cycle, 31 to 32. Uh, Kedogo, Doliana, will read six, 31, 32. Okay, so let's go in that order. Um, and I have the text in front of us. First one, Brenda. Okay. 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. The 12 apostles, and he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. 14, and he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brenda. Now, wonderful reading. And, and I want you to note one thing that I, I forgot to say, that as we read, uh, take note, take note of um, some of the values that we have seen in a transformational leader. And already you can see here, um, you know, you can mention them as we proceed before we move from one to another. Uh, this is Jesus uh, going up to the mountain and uh, calling to him those he desired to become the apostles or the disciples. He appointed the 12 as it has been read. Um, but then notice this, so that they might be with him. Right? We would imagine that they will be called to go out and preach. But that doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't happen until later. He calls them so that they might be with him. That's the key word right there, with him. 
and then he might send them out to preach. Okay. If anything stands out for you in terms of what we have seen uh, in, the, in the qualities of a transformational leader so far, uh, feel free to point it out as we read. So thank you, Brenda. Um, Maureen, 31 to 35. Okay. I need someone to also read. Um, hmm. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I forgot about that. Let me get another vo volunteer um, to read this bit. Yes, uh, Jenny. The bit I've highlighted up to 12, up, up, up to 20, sorry. Um, okay, that's um, which which highlights I'm seeing two highlights from my side. This one's here yeah, from 16 to 20. Uh, verse 16 he appointed the 12 Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonages, that is, sons of thunder. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and, and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot. And Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then he went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. All right. Very good reading. Very good reading. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Um, what do you see? I mean, this is Mark writing. So Mark is just recording what he saw. But then what does it tell about Jesus being a transformational leader here? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can we talk? Can we say sacrifice, Daktari? Uh, sacrifice. Uh, can you expound on that, please? <laughs> so that he could not even eat. <laughs> he left his food just to gather with the crowd. The heart of something very important, but he was more concerned about these people that had gathered around him. Yeah. Yeah. Getting so busy that they could not even eat. I mean, you want to tell someone is busy is when they get to that point, okay? The work is overwhelming, there's so much to do, um, and crowds are gathering and pushing that they could not even uh, eat. Um, are you also struck by the way Jesus is getting personal with his disciples? He's even giving them nicknames. Yes, Paul? Yeah, Dr. I wanted to say, mm -hmm. as a leader, you must uh, uh, get the best team. And uh, that's uh, what I'm getting from appointing the 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You must get the best, best yeah. team. Good. Very good. Very good. Um, yes. Um, and, and so th that's, that's very good. Thank you for gathering all that. I appreciate it. Um, then we skip some verses, uh, not because they're not important, because I want to just go to what is going to help us gather the transformational leader that is in Jesus. And now next up is uh, Maureen, uh, 31 to 35. Jesus, mother and brothers. <laughs> And his mother and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here 
are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. The word of God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, class, what are you gathering from that, from a transformational leader? Remember, this is like the very first, or do you call it a debut of Jesus into ministry? He's just gotten baptized by John the Baptist. He's just getting his feet into the ministry. Yes, Florence. Uh, sorry, I'm on the road, but um, I think for me, Jesus is showing uh, the fact that he's so focused on the calling and what he's supposed to do, and even family cannot distract him. And so for him, what makes sense, his family is what he's been called to do, and that is what he's focused. So for me, he even reminds me of Nehemiah um, in terms of the focus that he has at this particular moment in this scripture we've just read. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Focus. Focus. He's so focused on the goal of, let's say, the organization, so focused on the goal of his mission that he redefines family. Thank you, Florence. So he redefines his family. All right? And even expands his family in that redefinition to include whoever does the will of God. Whoever does the will of God. He is my brother and sister and mother. It doesn't mean that Jesus was disowning his own family. That's not the point. The point is he actually redefines those that are to be called family. So assume this has to be an organization with a team. You, you can see how it's playing out now. Okay. Very good. Um, then we head out to chapter... Um, Juliana, what, what part did I say you read? Chapter 5. So chapter 5. Um, okay, so I hope you're still following. Okay, before we get there, uh, uh, Juliana, read 4, 35 to 41. Okay. 35. On that day, yes. when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the, in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked, rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him. Mm. Very good. Right? What do you get from the values that we've just shared from your qualities of a transformational leader? Thank you. Thank you so much, Juliana, for a wonderful reading. What do you see? And now, are you trying to say inclusivity? Okay. 
Yes. Okay, can you say more about that? Okay, uh, good evening class. I, uh, mm -hmm. before, before they leave, uh, he includes the others uh, in the statements. He says, uh, let us go across to the other side. Now we've just learned that uh, a good leader uh, should include the team. Yeah, so uh, yeah. He's, he's, he's really trying to uh, give to instruct, but in a way that shows that he's also including them. Yeah, that's my two cents. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in other words, um, he is together with his followers in the storm. Okay. He is together with them in the storm. Uh, but also in the storm, he is reminding them that he is also human. Right? That he's exhausted, he is tired. Even though being God, he can fall asleep. Now, for you to get asleep, for you to sleep in through a storm, now, live alone in the ocean. I've not seen anyone who has slept through a storm, even if it was on the land. For those of you who ever lived in countries where there are storms, it's hard to sleep through a storm. Be it a tornado, be it a, um, a hurricane, whatever it is. Jesus is sleeping in a storm in the ocean. So you can imagine how humanly exhausted he is. All right, but then he is with them in the storm. I think that's a quality of leadership that we are seeing because most leaders would take advantage of their power to be out of the storm and leave everyone else in the storm. Jesus, being God, could have done that very easily. And even you can see the question that the disciples are asking, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing right here. Okay. But then when he wakes up, he rebukes the wind and he, he tells it, peace, peace, be still. And it ceased. In fact, the Bible says there was a great calm. And then Jesus now flips into his leadership role and asks, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Remember? All this while, he had been grilling them about faith. Okay. Yes, Sarangache and Abling others. Yes, Paul, I like this. Organizations might encounter storms. A leader should find solutions. Yes. And Jesus does exactly that. By the way, have you seen the kind of the style of leadership where leaders run away from storms? Or they seem to be indifferent about storms and they just expect the storms to weather away somehow to disappear by themselves and they just stand aloof very indifferent that something wrong is going on and needs your action okay but look at the end result of that is that the followers were filled with great fear and they said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Literally, they know that this was actually the creator of that storm, the creator of that wind, the creator of the sea and the creator of everything. Thank you. Thank you for those contributions. Um, now that uh, Juliana has read four, um, I, would, I would like Cindy to read five. And there's a place, uh, we'll not read the entire thing. Um, okay, let me just do this. Eh? Um, I just wanted to glance through five and see that Jesus now begins to encounter the spiritual world, the demonic world with his disciples. 
And the disciples are watching all this, okay, where he meets with the man with unclean spirit. Uh, once they manage to cross over the other side of the, of the ocean, uh, he heals the man. He tells the man to go away and not follow them and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he had, had mercy on you. Then he also goes, now it's miracle after miracle here. Healings, deliverance, and all that. Jesus heals a woman and Jairus' daughter. You know the story. Um, um, and even it's a question here. Um, Jesus is touched by someone. And this is in a place where there's a crowd. Um, and people are pushing towards Jesus. And this woman who had uh, a disease of hemorrhaging for years touches Jesus. And Jesus feels like uh, power has gone out of him. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about the crowd and said, who touched my garments? What do you think the disciples were supposed to do? In fact, the next verse 31 is the disciples say to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? So actually, that this statement in verse 30 is meant for the disciples. Okay. So back to the question, I think that was Caroline asking that question about problem, intellectual stimulation, problem solving, problem in cases, giving people a problem to deal with. This is it right here. Okay. Now, um, so there's that miracle happening. Um, then... Uh, bringing a girl back to life from death. Uh, this is the part that I want Sidi to read as we come to almost full cycle. Um, um, Which yeah, right. Uh, chapter 6, um, read from verse 1 to 5. Okay. Um, he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard were astonished. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and, and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Verse 4, and Jesus said to, to them, a prophet is not without honor except in, his, except in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hand on a few sick people and healed them. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So what, what are you reading here? What are you seeing? A transformational leader with his followers. What are they facing right now? Together? Opposition. Yeah, opposition, rejection, right? Yes, Josephine. Opposition, rejection. It's exactly that. Um, I wonder whether there are many leaders who are capable of handling that uh, well. Uh, because it, it doesn't go down easily when a leader is rejected by masses in the presence of the followers. And you see Jesus' statements here that a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. So Jesus is letting his followers, the disciples, know that rejection is coming right from home, right from family. And, and look at how that discourages him that he could not even perform any miracles here except just laying a few, you know, his hands on a few sick people and heal them. 
So that also has an impact on performance, has an impact on his ministry and deliver, de uh, delivery of it. Okay, so, and this, this goes on and on, right? We see events after events, there is a death in, um, in his mentor, the person who baptized him, John the Baptist, is beheaded by King Herod. I uh, will not get into the details of that, but I would like I would like someone to read this, and and I'm going actually to I'm going to appoint one, Caroline. This is the part I wanted you to see about intellectual stimulation, Caroline Dunge, uh, from verse thirty. Um, read all the way to. Um, hmm. Is a long one to forty four. I'll scroll it down for you. I don't. Yes. Read from 30. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Sorry, I am still on the road. I can't oh. read because I'm I'm still I'm concentrating on the road. Okay, okay. Um yeah. okay. I can hear. I can read. Please do, please do. Go ahead. From which verse? That one. From 30. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can read downwards. Okay, read to mm -hmm. 34 because I'd like a guy to read. We've had a lot of uh, ladies taking lead today. Um, oh. uh, we'll have Franco Chana read from 35. So you read 30 to 34, then Frank from 35 all the way down to 44. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, you said I read from 31, okay. Okay, right here. Uh, all right. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, they had no leisure even to eat. And they Just went stop. away in the box. Let's stop at that. Does that ring a bell? Anybody remembers coming across a similar verse again? Yeah. Yeah, when they didn't have time to eat. Jesus did. Yes. yes. Exactly. Engaged. Yeah. Now we've, we're coming full cycle. They are still busy, working very hard meeting people needs, preaching the gospel. And he says, oh, come away. This is Jesus telling his disciples, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. Okay, thank you. Proceed. Okay. Um, and they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now, Many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Thank you for that reading. Uh, we've seen a similar reading in chapter 3, if you remember, in chapter 3 as we were getting started. I'd like for Frank or Chana to divide this remaining bit with Jimmy. Uh, Frank and Jimmy, if you can divide from 36, you can read all the way to 38, and then Jim, uh, Jimmy will take from 39 to 44. Yes, Frank. Okay. I will read mm -hmm. from that from the T six. Send them send them away to go into surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Verse thirty seven. But he answered to them, "You give them something to eat," and they said to him. Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? 
verse 38, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. 39, then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Amen. Okay, very good reading. So there is intellectual stimulation, right? Giving them a problem to solve. He's just sending, you know, in other words, disciples here are asking Jesus to finish up preaching quickly so that people have time to go to the countryside, meaning home or, or towns, and fend for themselves, find some food to eat because they're hungry. These are like people in the thousands. Um, and they have been listening to Jesus preaching and following and watching all these miracles. None has had time to eat. And now everyone is hungry. And so the disciples see that, they see the, the coming danger, and they tell Jesus, hey, you, you've got to wind up this crusade. You've got to wind up this meeting. People need to go back home. But then he answered them, you give them something to eat. So he throws a challenge back to them. And they say to him, shall we go really and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them? In other words, this is, like, this is really expensive. This is very expensive to feed all these people. Then now he gives them the solution. All right. Yes, Jimmy. Yes. Okay. Up to which verse? 44. Uh, 40 to 44. Okay. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said, A blessing. So it might begin. Uh, so they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said, A blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them, among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that reading. Imagine we are talking about all these people. Uh, Kumbe, in the Jewish uh, culture, we are just counting men. And, and does it mean there were no women and children? There were but they only counted men, just like we see in the genealogies uh, in the scriptures. Um, so basically, thank you, Jimmy, for that. That's the, um, the outcome of that problem solved, that all these people get to eat um, and everyone is eaten up to their full. And they even have some to spare. Okay, very good. But Yang, I see your hand is up. Yeah, um, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, I wanted us to go back to that point that has been read before this, in which uh, the folks are saying, yeah, it should be this one. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Dr. Munyao, uh, about four or five weeks ago, we were in the class that was talking about mission. I forget the phrase, I'm sorry, I can look at it in my notes. But the idea of it was that sometimes spiritual organizations alter their mission and you used a certain phrase, so that mm. they start doing some other stuff away from spiritual work. Mission drift. Mm. Say that again. Mission drift. Mission drift. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mission mm. drift. And I recall very well within that class, some of the contention that uh, some of our colleagues had 
were that you find churches beginning to have other activities like feeding the poor, like getting money so that they may take children to school, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a animated discussions at that time about the significance of sticking to the mission. Mm -hmm. Yet in this reading, ideally, part of these verses that we've spoken about here may at that time five weeks ago been classified by some of our colleagues as mission drift. Even though we concluded that mission drift sometimes is not necessarily bad, but don't you see here now, we are praising mission drift more than at that particular time when we were talking about, you know, folks are doing more non-spiritual work than the uh, spiritual work that called on them. Uh, over to you, I hope I make sense. Thank you, thank you, thank you, um, uh, Madiang. And yeah, you're making a lot of sense. Um, I'd like to hear the feedback of others as to whether this is uh, can be classified as mission drift in light of this context. Yes, Josephine. Thank you, Daktari. Okay, uh, I have a contrary opinion. Uh, I think uh, Jesus only turned the food eh? or multiply, multiplied the food. But the people who fed the, the 5,000 people are the disciples. He ordered them to feed them. So uh, I think if we, they could have left people to go and look for their own food, the mission, which was to spread the gospel, could not have uh, been done the way it was planned. So Jesus remained focused to the mission of uh, spreading the gospel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that. Um... And, and, and I think um, in responding to Madiang and also in agreement with you, uh, uh, jo Josephine, is that uh, we don't see a stoppage of doing good by Jesus and preaching the gospel after these incidents. In fact, we don't see any other occurrence where Jesus feeds people like this. But this, in capturing what Madiang is trying to put across to us, is that um, Jesus comes to a point where he realizes that for people to continue listening to him, they must be fed. Otherwise, they will not listen to him. All right? Or he has kept people waiting for this long listening to the word of God from him. And so it's time for him to provide so that they can have energy either to go back home or to continue sticking by him and following with the proceedings of his ministry. And so, and there is in no way that that action, that act of feeding the 5,000 plus does overtake the preaching of the gospel. In fact, what you see after this incident is that you see Jesus and his disciples moving to another location, even crossing the sea. And there, thinking that they will not find people, they find the same people that they have fed have actually ran ahead of them and are waiting on the other side of the ocean. And Jesus tells them clearly, I know that you're here, not because of the word, but because of the the bread and the fish that you ate, the food that I gave you over the other side. Then he tells them, do not labor for food that perishes. You know that story. Um, so so there is there is no way in this providing for a need, an immediate need, like we saw in other organizations when you talked about mission drift, that does not overtake the core mission of Jesus and company, which is Jesus and his disciples. And that is preaching the good news, spread the good news, healing people and delivering people. 
Yes, Cindy. Yes, uh, Dr. Ali, what I wanted to say is that uh, I don't think it was a mission drift. When you are discussing or when you are having discussions on the on the topic, you said that uh, mission drift is where you completely uh, drift away from the core mission or the goal of what you are called to do. But uh, in this case, we are not seeing this happen. It's only that Jesus is trying to attend to a basic need of the people around him. So personally, I don't think there is mission trait in this context. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and, uh, and uh, thank you very much, Cindy, for that uh, input. It, it adds on to what we have said. And so, uh, Madiang, does, does that uh, respond to your question? Do you still see an element of where an organization's uh, core business is to um, help farmers develop um, new technologies in farming, adopt adopt new technologies in farming, but then in the process they realize they need to to dig uh, to drill water borehole for the community to drink, and so for people to be able to listen to them and and follow and learn, they have to stop traveling long distances to get water. All right. Good. Good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what I like is to link the classes because they are not standalone. And yes. my recollection is at that time, some of the examples that were used at that yes. particular time to, in quotes, dismiss mission drift was, mm. you know, feeding, yet you have to do spiritual. But yeah. I am absolutely aware of the need of the need to take care of folks. And I think um, uh, yourself and I think it was the first speaker have spoken mm -hmm. of the need at the time. Uh, and that is uh, well noted on my end. Asante Sana. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you, Madiang, and thank you who has uh, contributed to this. So you see the cycle here. Um, and in trying to learn from Jesus' model of a transformational leader, this long passage that we could not read all, but we try to pick out or select some uh, passages, start with Jesus having appointed the 12 uh, so that they can be with him. But then before that, we come across this sentence that um, they they were so uh, pressed in terms of work and assignment that they did not even have time to eat, all right? Because the crowds were pushing, they were gathering. The, 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 the Jesus and company team were getting so busy, all right? And they needed to retreat. And I think in the starting of this class, I emphasized the importance of resting. You see even Jesus emphasizing it himself. Uh, and that passage ends with chapter 6, 31. We see again uh, Jesus emphasizing that, guys, we've been up and about. Let's come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Okay? So you see, um, this kind of a leader is empathetic to the people that he identifies with what the people are going through. I think we saw that. I think we saw that in the video. Uh, it's not where I'm looking. We saw that in the video. Yeah. But anyway, um, I want to make mention of that so that I can bring us to this last uh, image that is before you. Uh, the Flywheel of Transformational Leadership by Marian Temen. Um, is that now your your leaders at some you know level? You guys are leaders, uh, wherever you are, and um, or you are going to be in teams of leadership. And I want you to know that according to Marian Temen, uh, life is full of disruptive triggers. We just saw very recently how the pandemic 
uh, disrupted life, uh, technology advancements come and replace the old ones, geopolitical tensions that are happening all over around the world, you know that. Climate change is not new to you. It's shifting the way we live, right? Evolving uh, customer expectations. And so this flywheel of transmissional leadership gives us what we need, the dynamic forces that are required to maintain the momentum. An era of constant change occasioned by the disruptive triggers that demand systemic change in how we run our organization. And so one of them is visionary leadership. And a visionary leadership, uh, basically you as a leader are to communicate. Um, am I cut off? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can hear you. There was a oh, little okay. blip, but you're back. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, as a visionary leader, you, you ought to communicate a compelling vision through stories or creating a shared sense of purpose. I think now that is very obvious to most of you who are already practicing this in your own leadership spaces or have learned about this or are, have actually been doing this for quite a long time. You must have a vision. You must, you must deliver visionary leadership. But also to build trust, uh, you demonstrate reliability and authenticity to create safe space for expressing and risk-taking. One of us in this class today shared of how hostile our work environment has become. Uh, that's obviously an organ a, a, work and a leadership environment or work environment that lacks safe spaces for expressing ourselves as humans, but also showing capability that we can do, yet take risks. Change agents, you know, as a leader, You've got to empower and support change agents to catalyze change sustainably. So as your followers that are also being transformed into leaders, get empowered, get supported uh, to be appreciated, to know that, hey, they are catalyzing change here and therefore you help them to think on how to sustain that. Then, as a leader, also, you've got to cultivate diversity and empowered teams. Cultivate diversity and empowered teams. Now, these uh, Marian Temen calls twin pillars. Twin pillars for nurturing resilience and fostering innovation. Whereby, on the one hand, you're cultivating diversity. Therefore, you are not uh, discriminating anyone based on anything to become part and parcel of um, um, your, 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 your team. But then but at the same time, on the other hand, you're empowering that person, you're empowering those people so that they operate at their optimum best. Okay? Then as a leader, you've got to offer an environment of hyper-collaboration. So you, you really get into the organization and identify where people are working in silos and dismantle those silos so that you can help your team members to see the importance of the other uh, department of the same organization and help them to see what collaboration is able to do across the organization. All right? Then the celebratory cadence, whereby as a leader, you move the organization and the followers to recognize and celebrate small achievements, small wins, to build a sense of community and progress. So in your organization, 
Um, are there people who are getting promoted? That's a reason to celebrate. Um, are there team members who are getting married? That's a reason to celebrate. Has there been a child born in a, in, in, in a family of a member of the team? That's a reason to celebrate. Um, uh, what's going on in the lives of the team members? Identify those small you know, happenings in the lives of your followers and team members and make the celebratory cadence. It really brings in the sense of being human. Um, in a team and the, and the person feels like, really, this is another extension, an extension of my family in my work environment. And imagine how productive such a person will be. Then as a leader, encourage systems thinking, whereby you understand the interconnectedness and focus on pattern recognition for proactive problem solving. We, we've just seen that. Uh, from the example of Jesus, creating a situation and, and throwing the challenge to the disciples, asking them, you provide um, uh, so that we, we see, we see what can be done. Let me see what you can do. And as a leader, you really want to promote uh, systems thinking by allowing your team members to think, to think, to, you know, so you're stimulating their inter intellectual capacity. Um, then intellectual agility enable continuous learning, upskilling, fostering a culture of curiosity and knowledge sharing. Uh, this is in a sense where you're promoting uh, staff advancement, uh, members of your team to advance um, continuously, upskilling them, uh, capacity building, fostering that culture of learning and curiosity and growing together as we discover new trends, new mechanisms, new solutions, new whatever uh, that can add value to the growth and life of the organization. Uh, then adaptive project management. Uh, in, in this, Marian Temen talks about creating balance between structure and flexibility to accommodate inevit inevitable uh, 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 changes. You've got to adapt. You've got to adapt. Um, um, you've got to create solutions, balance between structures, be flexible to deliver. Uh, in a world that is changing, in a world that is ever-changing, in an environment that has dynamic forces uh, pulling and pushing from uh, every corner, you cannot be static. You cannot afford to be rigid. You've got to be dynamic. You've got to be dynamic. And I think, friends, with those nine points, we form what we are calling the, the flywheel of transformational leadership. The flywheel looks like a gear. You're incorporating all this in a gear to solve these existential challenges that will happen once in a lifetime or once in a while or even occasionally depending on the environment that you are situated in. All right. And so, uh, class, uh, that brings us to the end um, of um, our discussion for tonight. And so to speak, uh, for this unit, um, I, I would like uh, to offer any room for uh, engagement as we close. I would like for us to uh, close in the next um, uh, five minutes or so, uh, so that I can let you uh, have time with your families this evening. Um, but any questions regarding any assignments or the, the last assessment, the final project that I can respond to quickly. But uh, before you do that, uh, for those who have not joined in, I appreciated your time and, and your challenge. And um, I had to say that I've also learned from you. Um, and I think given another chance to teach this class, I'll, um, I have learned. I have learned how to do it better. And uh, your evaluations are going to be helpful, uh, not only to better me, but also the one who will teach again this unit if it's not me. Uh, so your honest evaluation uh, is going to 
contribute a lot into making this unit better for the next group. Okay. Yeah, so I'm seeing one question already. Uh, let me see. It's on, a, will we write a reflection for this week again? Um, okay, uh, I think for this being the last week, I'm going to excuse you from having to write a reflection. Uh, focus, because you have a lot to focus on right now. Um, I understand you have a lot to focus on right now, so no, I'll not provide a place for that. Uh, Jenny? My, 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 uh, mine is not a question. Mm -hmm. It's a, I don't know what to call it, an observation or a, those are my remarks for this class. I'll be very sincere. When mm -hmm. we started, um, I remember somebody made a joke and said, uh, I think at the end of this lesson, you're going to be, are we, are we, are we learning to be theologians? Mm -hmm. And uh, what I can honestly say is, I, I don't think, uh, I have been turned into a theologian, but there are critical aspects I have learned and I have gained by the way you have related uh, our our daily experiences and the scripture, the, mm -hmm. the leadership and what the word of God says. And it has not turned me into a, a, a priest or a pastor or a theologian, but it has opened my eyes in terms of the way I I look at things as a leader. And uh, honestly, I, I I thank you. I have gained a lot. God bless you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That's really encouraging to, to hear. Um, and my heart is encouraged. Um, uh, I'm glad that this is how uh, this unit has helped you in your personal life and uh, in your leadership uh, capacity. Thank you so much, I appreciate Florence. Florence and then Madian. Uh, Malimu, uh, mine is to just say, there's a time and maybe share a story. There's mm -hmm. a time I was in class. Uh, I usually take my class in the office and a colleague happened to come into my office and she she sat down waiting for me, assuming I'm finishing. And she got some snippets of our class. And so after that, she also walked into Prof's class one day when I was in class and uh, listened to the devotion left. So every week she asked me, eh, what is your Monday class? What was the focus about leadership? Because we are both leaders in the office. And so... Sometimes I keep on sharing anecdotes of what we are learning and, and applying and seeing what that means within the environment I am in. And so this class has been very valuable for me. And I like, I, I really enjoyed it because it takes me back to the source, which is uh, the word of God, uh, which is what should be guiding me. And so I really appreciate this class. When times I have felt that uh, this is too much, not the class, but the course in general, given my work and everything, this class has grounded me uh, to remain uh, steadfast, to remain focused. And so I appreciate you, Mwalimu Asante Sana. Sorry, I think I was muted. Thank you, Florence, for that. Um... Uh, encouragement. I appreciate it. And um, um, I hope that we are able to convert your colleague uh, to take this program next time it's offered. Uh, thank you very much for being a good it, ambassador. He's actually waiting for it to be open. Two of them, uh -huh. they are waiting for it to be open to lo to join in. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, Madiang and then Juliet Sam Dosanya. I think we'll stop. Yeah, thank you that. very much. Oh, sorry. Yes. Proceed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Martin Munyao. Um, amazing intellectual uh, stimulation. Now, just two things. One, I hope you will be available for consultation, maybe via call or chat. Um, I think I also missed a few classes, so I will need to update some of the reflections. But I hope you don't mind being reached out if it will not be overwhelming to you. 
if uh, it's overwhelming and understanding. <laughs> um, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I the think second... it's okay to answer to that. It's okay. I'm I'm yeah. open. I'm available. Um, yeah. I I think my phone contact is on the course outline. Mm. Um, mm. So feel free to get in touch with me and consult with me. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the second one is uh, I will join Jane and uh, Florence in uh, appreciating the class, but I also think I should be compelled to uh, note that this class also happened under a context and a time when Daystar was follow was experiencing um, false accusation of indoctrination, forcing folks to do some courses and all that kind of stuff. And I think that um, within that particular context, um, many of us stand up with uh, data because the experience we've had is simply based on the education teams that we signed up for leadership. Um, why I also say this is because I'm so glad Daysta chose to talk about biblical foundations of leadership that also essentially tells us there are many, many other foundations of leadership that we should always look out for. In your last... Uh, uh, illustration that you've put up there, one of the things they are talking about transformational leadership is the use of stories. And so here we, or I should say, I have been equipped on the use of the Bible and the biblical mm -hmm. stories, and that opens up, even if it is the use of the Quran, the Quranic foundations on leadership, you know, um, and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to say that and say that I appreciate the class and uh, in the context of these experiences that were nasty at some point, I am a witness that they are false because this was really embedded in making us good leaders. So thank you. I wish you all the best in your endeavors and uh, I really appreciate your patience. Thank you and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Madiang. And um, I appreciate um, your your style and manner of uh, communicating uh, comments and points. Um, I, I do not uh, take it for granted that uh, your opinions over things and your comments has been very sober and balanced and together with others too, uh, not just you. And um, that also, that's those are the kind of points I'm making in terms of that I learned myself, I, I got to learn from each and every one of you, uh, including uh, Madiang. And so thank you. Thank you so much um, for the kind words. And uh, um, one of the recommendations actually I made when we were crafting this course or this program, this unit, particular, this biblical foundations, I asked the question, why can't it be called uh, religious foundations? Uh, of leadership so that we can also benefit from other religious traditions and values in making up good leadership. But um, the the highs had it that uh, we just make it Christian foundations and, and so I lost. But anyway, uh, your comment is very valid onto that. Yes, yes, Juliet, and then uh, Sam, and then Osanya. We'll stop at Osanya. And then uh, I'll ask for a volunteer to pray. And um, in praying, also pray for me, uh, pray for my colleagues who are teaching this program and uh, pray for the colleagues who will be teaching in the coming trimester, that uh, there will be coherence in, in uh, what we are trying to deliver in making this um, class one of the best as a pioneers in this program. Uh, who will do that? Let's get that uh, uh, straight up. <clears throat> would like a volunteer to close in prayer, or or would you like a priestly a priestly prayer from my side? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. 
Okay, so us. Then Juliet, and then Sam, and then Osanya. Thank you so much, Dr. I've, I've always looked forward to Monday. You know, Monday is always a, a busy day, and you are coming from the weekend and reporting to work after rest. <coughs> so this class has always been so enjoyable, uh, a lot of participation. I love the way you put it open, that there's a lot of uh, sharing and just listening to our ideas and so on. And um, just looking at it, I think one of one of these days when I won, uh, when I was doing in class, I was asked by someone around me, "Are you people take? Are you people doing theology in that class in that unit?" Then I was like, "No, it's not theology. It's just about the biblical uh, foundational teachings concerning leadership." And so it has been so good. And I think one of the things I've picked up is that nowadays when I read the Bible, I'm very careful. I'm like, "What can I pick?" Especially when it's a character. What can I pick from here? If this person is a leader, what is this person demonstrating? So that my leadership is not just based on the things we learn or uh, the trainings we undergo, but what does the Bible say about it? And I think that has been so good. And uh, I've really loved your lectures. You as an individual, as a, as a teacher, I've really loved the way you handle the class, your calmness and just being understanding and being there for us all the time. And I'm just praying, hoping if it's possible, you can still have you next semester. If if the course is still going on, I would still wish to meet you and just to sit and listen to you teachers. Otherwise, thank you so much. May God uh, expand you and uh, give you more knowledge. And I must say you are so rich in the word. Eh? You know, sometimes you give us some scriptures and then you're like, Tell me, what are we picking from here? The characters. I'm really cracking my mind. Like, I don't see any point. But you bring it out so easily. Like, you just mention one or two words. Then the point is there. And I'm like, hey, I didn't see this one. I just love the way you are so rich in, in the word. I don't know that you did theology, but you do it so well. Thank you. God bless you. Hoping to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. And um, I, I appreciate uh, your kind words. And um, yeah, I am grateful that uh, from your statement and others that uh, we are not, the intention is not to try and convert you to become theologians, but to become uh, better people in what you do, uh, become good people in what you do. Um, you know, people that are led uh, by God, uh, the fear of God is in your heart, but also getting to know leadership from his perspective so that we have the blueprint clear. Um, and so that's why. That's why we had this unit being made part of this program, just to make that possible. So thank you. Thank you so much. And, and um, the influence this has had in your own life and the lives of others around you, um, and those who are listening, because you know, when we are teaching online, we are teaching families and offices. I appreciate that it was positive. Um, thank you so much, uh, uh, Juliet. Yes, Sam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Terry. I, I was actually fearing uh, because you, you sounded like you were going off. And I was wondering if you, you were going to, you know, go off completely before I say what I wanted to say. Uh, yeah. uh, now, uh, if it were not that uh, I, I was already lined up for a comment, I would very easily have, uh, you know, uh, left because uh, the two last speakers uh, seem to have picked words from my lips. Uh, to begin with, um, Madiang mentioned something to do with uh, intellectual stimulation. And uh, Juliet has talked about subject knowledge. Th those are the two things that I actually wanted to talk about. And, and, and because I was speaking soon after them, I have not been able to think of uh, something else to say. But I would like to, to reiterate the fact that um, your, your lectures have been, uh, I think, in my opinion, the most intellectually stimulating. And this is uh, especially because, in my opinion, and I, I want to issue a caveat here. I'm not even very sure that I'm, I'm qualified to make this comment. 
uh, the comment I want to make is that uh, you come across as um, uh, a teacher who has uh, what we call very strong subject knowledge. Uh, and this actually goes a long way to intellectually stimulate uh, your students. Uh, and I hope that I'm speaking uh, for, you know, if not uh, all of them, uh, most of us. Uh, and so for this reason, I want to uh, commend you uh, whatever it is you you have done in your life that has made you this deep, uh, if you have a secret to share uh, in as few words that, as it may take to say, could you please? And uh, may God bless you as you continue blessing others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sam. Thank you, Sam, so much for, for that. Um, and and uh, uh, yes, I'm going to share a bit of that uh, towards the end in, in a passage that I'm going to read in blessing the class. But I'm glad to hear that uh, you enjoyed this class and this was one of your best. I mean, that's such a, a, a good way uh, to end the class when I hear students say that, that this was one of the best uh, classes you had this trimester. <clears throat> and um, if, and if I don't get an opportunity to teach another, I'm sure that I'm going to come across um, uh, supervision of thesis uh, for some of you, should I be uh, assigned any one of you to supervise. And so we'll continue this uh, discussion, we'll continue this intellectual engagement uh, now in research, uh, which, which I also love and enjoy, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to get somewhere. But thank you, thank you so much. That's really heartwarming to hear. Lastly, Osanya. Thank you, Dr. Good evening. Mm -hmm. I have noted my mic was unmuted. Sorry for that. It's okay, no problem. Mm, mine, yeah, mine is a bit... Uh, I agree with my classmates and colleagues about their comments. Mine is a bit directed to you as the uh, director of Odell. When we were doing this program, initially we were promised that classes would alternate. We will not learn daily. I think that really motivated us to take this program. Mm. But things have turned different. We are in class throughout, week in, week out. Mm. Uh, I really don't know what happened. We were told maybe we're in class one week, we, we are off class, two weeks doing work, but it turned different. Maybe you can address it going in future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> we're glad. Thank you. Thank you, Osanya, and uh, I appreciate your frankness and honesty in this and uh, I want to assure you that I hear you um, and I carry that that burden with you because um, uh, my understanding of uh, an online program is that my initial understanding was that it was going to be self-based. Um, okay, let me let me stop recording at this point. Yeah.